here at Hope Community, United Church of Christ, we like to say we take the Bible seriously, but not literally. For many who have experienced communities of faith who do take the Bible literally, that but may be a very important difference. Have you noticed that when the conjunction but is used, the second phrase tends to overshadow the first? The movie was good, but it was long. Mm -hmm. Here, remember, it's long. He's the most handsome guy in the world, but he's fun to be with. The dog seems friendly, but he bites. <laughs> <laughs> Our slogan is inspiring, but I'd like to suggest that just for now we turn it around. We don't take the Bible literally. We don't take the Bible literally, but we do take it seriously. The Bible is often considered one book, but it's actually a large collection of different writings. <coughs> That's why the pages are so thin, because they have to squeeze them all in there. Otherwise, it'd be like an encyclopedia. <laughs> the Bible is often, often considered one book, but it is a large collection of different writings. In fact, some of the books, like the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles, they might actually share an author. And some, like Isaiah, might have multiple authors. And the Bible has many examples of how to live, but can we consider the whole of the Bible as a manual for life, or as some say, basic instructions before leaving earth? For those of us whose exposure to the Bible is primarily the text we read on Sunday mornings, we need to recognize that many churches, like hope on most Sundays, follow the revised common lectionary. The lectionary is a set of prescribed readings on a three-year cycle. You might think that the lectionary would cover the entire Bible in those three years, but it doesn't. Left out of the lectionary are texts that may not mean a lot to us. For example, the genealogies, or as a lot of us call them, the begets. <laughs> Can you imagine a morning of just sitting here listening to begets? <laughs> How would you preach on that? Also left out are some texts that are difficult to figure out, like some parts of Revelation. And some texts that are downright disturbing, like some of the parts of the Book of Judges. Read the last few chapters if you really kind of want a horror film. In fact, the Revised Common Lectionary does not include the books of 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Obadiah, Nahum, 1st, uh, I'm sorry, 2nd and 3rd John, or Jude, at all. Not one verse. The lectionary helps us to read through a lot of the Bible, but it leaves out some parts. And those parts are sometimes used in ways that harm people. There are some very difficult parts in the Bible about women, such as the one in today's Old Testament reading from Ezekiel, which, by the way, is not in the lectionary. <laughs> <laughs> what do we do with these scriptures? Should we embrace them, ignore them? wrestle with them? Hope is a progressive Christian church, and I'm hoping all of us reject the idea of violence against women. We're not going to embrace these scriptures uncritically, nor are we going to ignore them. We may not take the Bible literally, but we are going to take it seriously. So perhaps we'll focus on what it's meant to teach. Clearly there must be a point that the prophet was making. In fact, the prophet is talking about Israel not being faithful to its covenant with God and worshiping other gods. But why did the prophet have to use this imagery of violence against women? For a couple of reasons. The metaphor was understandable to the audience, primarily men, and the language held the attention of that same audience. In better love, marriage, sex, and violence in the Hebrew prophets Renita J. Weems writes, ancient men were deeply invested in talk about wives deviating from the norms and wives flouting their marital responsibilities. After all, promiscuity in women posed a threat to the social and property codes that were the basis of Israel's patriarchal identity. So the prophets used vivid descriptions of something familiar and important in men's lives. The prophets used the customs of the time to graphically illustrate a point. 
We also need to recognize that the cultural context informed the writing of scripture. And that the scripture reinforced the cultural context. In a society where property is passed down from father to son, and where the man's control of the household is a major portion of his status in the community, it's not surprising that such writings will reinforce behavior that supports these notions. Of course, this is thousands of years ago. Society has come a long way since then. The basis of the metaphor, the social acceptance of violence against women as a means of maintaining social order, is no longer valid, is it? Can we just skip these scriptures as meaningless in our current context? We might think they no longer hold meaning. <coughs> But, for many, they do. In every two minutes, battered women and feminist interpretation, Susan Brooks Thistlethwaite writes, the metaphor of patriarchal marriage for divine human relationship is not one of mutuality. It is an image of domination and subordination in that cultural context. Likewise, tying marriage to the divine human relationship clearly Devonizes male superiority in that relationship. Dr. Thistlethwaite is saying that using heteros human heterosexual marriage as a metaphor for the relationship between God and mankind, or Jesus and the church, turns male dominance into a relation uh, in a relationship into something that is ordained by God. Can that really be true? Well, we may say that these metaphors cannot be read in verse. We can't say that the relationship between Israel and God or the church and Christ are a picture of the relationship between men and women. But they're often read this way. Let me give you one example from my experience. In a tradition called Bible Students, with which I was familiar about a quarter of a century ago, <laughs> there was a question about the roles of women. This was primarily among the young adults, as those senior to us seem to have settled on the silence of women in the church, and that women should wear head coverings. But, among young adults, and I really was a young adult way back then, uh, the argument for keeping women in subjection was this. If we allow women as equals, then it distorts the picture of Christ as bridegroom and church as bride. Let me rephrase that. We must continue behavior from an older context, an older cultural context, because it was used as a metaphor for something important, and now we're stuck with it. <laughs> Renita J. Williams again writes, metaphors matter, because they teach us how to imagine what has previously remained unimaginable. In this case, the battered, promiscuous wife in the books of Hosea, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel makes great mutilation, and sexual humiliation, defensible forms of retaliation against wives accused of sexual infidelity. No, I said accused. Now in our Gospel reading, which is in the lectionary for this very Sunday next year, we have a story that's familiar to most, if not all of us, the parable of Good Samaritan. So, should modern-day priests and Levites, let's say pastors and theologians, continue to leave mugging victims to die along the way so that a good, modern-day Good Samaritan can come along and have the opportunity to help? Can a pastor or theologian use the excuse, well, I would have helped, but it would mess up Jesus' story? <laughs> <laughs> for the suffering of another cannot be excused simply because it upholds a biblical illustration. Likewise, in the treatment of women in the Bible, we need to recognize that the cultural context of these illustrations make the illustrations work. But that doesn't mean that the cultural context is God's way for people to live. We can only discern that such a context was prevalent and understood by those who heard it when it was originally spoken or written. When we read biblical illustrations that use violence against women as a picture of God's wrath 
against a nation. And we should read them. We should not assume that the violence against women is the lesson. But we must also recognize that there are people who do take the Bible literally. There are men who use these texts and texts like these to justify the mistreatment of women. And there are also women who use these texts to blame themselves for their own abuse. And here's where it gets tough, people. While we, re we maintain our right, even our duty, to wrestle with these troubling scriptures, to see how they speak to us as illustrations of relationships with the eternal, rather than to accept scriptures as example of the proper relationships between men and women. What do we say to those who do take the Bible literally? Can we just say, you're wrong, as some of them have said to us? Mm. Or do we just ignore the abuse and say, well, you know, it's their belief. I want to go back to that story of the Good Samaritan. We might assume that the priest and the Levite were keeping the law of the covenant. Some interpretations of the story have the priest and the Levite keeping to the opposite side of the road so they don't touch the suffering man in case he might be dead. And by touching the dead, become ritually unclean. This actually is kind of a problem if you're heading back to your village because if you're ritually unclean, you have to go back to the temple again. You're going to be late. But the Samaritan was moved with pity. Some interpretations say his guts were wrenched. And he showed the man mercy. The Samaritan acted as a neighbor to the man. In our case, when we see someone who is a victim of abuse, can we turn our heads away and say, well, this is not our business? Can we be more concerned with our modern ritual cleanliness, our religious tolerance, than the suffering of another human being? In short, what does it take for us to be neighbors? As a progressive church, whose mission is to witness to God's compassion, enable God's justice, prosper God's peace, and be God's presence, when there is discussion about whether rape jokes are funny, when a judge says that an attack is not attempted rape because the victim is transgender, we must be engaged as people called to unite personal faith with social justice, prayer with peacemaking, and spirituality with action. At Hope, we don't take the Bible literally, but we do take it seriously. Taking the Bible seriously means engaging the text, wrestling with it, understanding the context in which it is written, what it was supposed to teach, and why. But we have to recognize when an interpretation is causing actual harm to our neighbors. As much as we would like to reject these troubling texts, we cannot pretend they don't exist. We cannot pretend they don't matter. And we can't make them go away. Instead, if we are to be responsible people of the book, we must take the Bible and its implications for us and for our neighbors seriously. But now